We're set up. Yes. I like it. Okay. Welcome in person and online. Thank you for attending our session on creating accessible images, graphs, and charts. So I'm Anna Coral, I'm the Data Visuals and Machine Reporting Specialist. Hope you can present both of you. Hello, I'm Kate Forrest. I'm content coordinator. I know you both as well. That's how we're doing that again. There we go. Okay. So today we'll be talking about some key accessibility mindsets you can apply to graphics, but to accessibility in general. And then we'll talk through some specific applications with images and alt text and data visualizations. We'll have time for questions, of course. So this is a graphic from Microsoft uh, Inclusive Guidebook, Microsoft Toolkit, and it shows some examples of situational temporary and permanent disabilities. Um, when we say the word disability, most people think of like the big ones, like being in a wheelchair or having one arm, being blind, being deaf, that sort of thing. Um, but accessibility features also can help people who are in situational and temporary disability situations, situational situations, um, such as having an arm injury, having limited use of one arm or leg, having cataract surgery where you can't see temporarily, um, having an ear infection where you can't hear temporarily, um, and then the situational um, instances, um, for example, being a new parent, having like a blob attached to your hip, literally. Cooking dinner is fun with a baby on your hip. I don't know if you ever did that, but um, being a distracted driver, being in a very loud environment, or conversely, being in a very quiet environment where you might not be able to listen to videos. So all of those are situational things, if you wanted to say situational situations, um, but accessibility features incorporated into digital materials can help all of these instances, as well as people who aren't experiencing any sort of disability whatsoever. So we start off with key concepts and then we're going to go on the next slide. Um, the best way to incorporate accessibility is to start at the beginning as much as possible. Uh, keep the user experience in mind. Whenever we create materials, we consider ourselves the ultimate user, which is not always true because as we saw from the previous slide, there are different people who have different abilities and different constraints as us. So when creating digital material of any kind, you always want to keep the end user experience in mind. Um, consider incorporating accessibility at the beginning. The sooner within the project you can incorporate accessibility, the better off everybody's going to be um, because the longer you wait, the more time and money it's going to cost you to do remediation as opposed to just incorporating it early on in the project. So I went to a conference a number of years ago, a couple of years ago, and I met a um, man who was blind named Bill, and we were in an alt text session together. And in discussing what was needed for alt text, he said to me, I need to know only what I need to know. And he doesn't care about any other context, we, we want to try to put like novels in all text. We want to try to give all of the details for all of the things. And Bill said, I don't need to know all of that. I just need to know why that image is there. I only need to know the information that's most important. And I thought that was a pretty powerful statement. So I try to use that in the back of my head when I'm like crafting all text and what's the most important thing that the users need to know out of this element. So this ties into our first key concept, which is context. So what I keep in mind when I'm designing the data visualization, what keep, keeps in mind for alt text is what is the purpose of your visual? Uh, what is the actual message you're trying to convey with it? Uh, and like Kate said, what does the audience actually need to know? So if you're including a bar chart, what is the data message you want there? Um, if you're comparing two groups, you don't need a million groups visible. Uh, the second key concept is redundancy, so providing information in multiple forms. Um, and redundancy can have like a negative connotation, but it's really great actually to have information in multiple ways for people to understand and explore it. So not just having an image, but having an image with a caption, with a text description, with that alt text, um, or to not just present a bar graph, but to provide it in context. Like you're summarizing what the key points are, you're having data level labels when necessary. 
um, maybe a caption if you need to. And the third key concept is simplicity. So the audience actually needs to understand what the message is. So keep it simple and predictable. Whether you're designing a data visualization, that could mean maybe sticking with a bar chart if that's the best fit. You don't have to get super fancy. Um, and for all text, keeping it succinct and concise. Um, so probably a max of about 150 words. Yeah, 150, 140, 150 is about the, the general guideline, like the same sort of basis as a, as a tweet. Say that one more time then the 140 150 words for the for the alt text. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Screen readers cannot pause during alt text. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. So when someone is listening using a screen reader, they have to listen to the entirety of the alt text. They can't pause it and go back or listen to something else, uh, you know, listen to something repeatedly. So the longer your alt text is, the more kind of cumbersome and interruptive it is to the actual materials. So the general guideline, it's not a hard, fast rule, but the general guideline is 140, 150 words. Thanks. Okay, and you already asked your questions. Great. Um, Any other questions? Yes. Oh. <laughs> now you're, now you're, you're perfect. Timing. And Terry, if you have anything on the way, feel free to unmute or add in the chat. Tyrion, Tyrion, sorry, sorry. I just want to make sure that Tyrion can hear me because I'm sort of standing a little bit further away from the mic. So, oh yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. I can hear you both. Um, later on, will you be able to show us, uh, show an example of alt text in like a PowerPoint, for example? Not a PowerPoint specifically, but we do have a number of different examples that we will touch on in the next couple well, of sessions. Okay, so hopefully Great. we'll cover what it is that you yeah imagine. Okay. So we'll talk about accessible images, first of all. Uh, image alt text can be a very gray area. The meaning of the alt text can change based on the context that the image is being used in. So again, you want to provide very concise meaning. Um, you don't necessarily need to describe exactly what is happening in the picture, but what is the purpose of that particular element? Why is it there? What are you trying to portray to the audience? Um, images that are just there for kicks, for filler, no particular meaning, no particular reason. Personally, I would consider removing them, or you could mark them um, with the alt text of decorative in quotes. And that alerts the, well, I think the screen reader would then read that as decorative. So it would alert the screen reader user that there's an image there, but it really has no meaning to anyone. Um, and then don't use images of text. Any text that appears within an element should be written out either in the alt text or in the text of the, uh, like the body. Um, so it's definitely not recommended to use word art or anything of that nature that has images of text. So one example, um, we have a very generic alt text for this particular image would be a woman looking out over the water with a beach volleyball game happening in the background. Like that's what's in the image, that's what we're looking at. So the alt text is not wrong. It's extremely generic. It doesn't tie this image to anything in particular and it doesn't give us any sort of particular purpose or meaning. Um, the image was taken from the Oswego.edu homepage a couple of years ago and it was tied to a news article that specifically targeted this woman. So the more specific, meaningful alt text would be wellness management major Fadi Gay, who earned SUNY's Norman R. McConney Jr. Award for Student Excellence. So the location, the, the beach, the background, the water, none of that has any context, none of that has any purpose. We're focusing in on the woman and the achievement that she um, received. And so that's what the alt text is conveying. Another example, we have Washington Crossing the Delaware by Emmanuel Lutz, 1851. This was taken from the public domain. That's what it is. It doesn't give us any indication of what's in the actual image, but it tells us what the image is. So again, more specific, if this was being used to demonstrate, I don't know, some sort of wartime something or other in an article, um, instead of simply giving the name of the piece of art, we may want to describe it. So we can say a general, or we can say General Washington, and his troops in boats on an icy river, one man is holding an American flag. That gives us a much better visual of what is actually taking place or what is happening in 
the uh, in the element. Um, and something we did want to touch on was artificial intelligence. So, of course, everyone's talking about it. So, with all text, like, could it help? Um, the answer is kind of. So, this is the screenshot of the PowerPoint options it gives you. So here's the alt text Kate wrote. So Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, and then there's this button generate alt text for me, which is AI generated. And it gives us a painting of a group of people on a boat. And it gives us a low confidence interval. So it's surprisingly accurate, right? Like it's, it's not it's impressive that they can do that, but it doesn't have the context yeah. that the content creator does. So if this is for an art class, uh, that's just not but it's also suggesting that you include in the alt text the art description automatically generated with low confidence. Is that part of what the alt text would be if you went with that one? I, it looks like it would read that. I'm not sure, but the message is for, for me, I guess, as the, yeah. the person generating it. That's what a screen reader screen reader would read. And that would count as the alt text. Yeah, so it would say description automatically generated. Um, so again, I think that would give the user like an, an indication, you know, AI did this, but AI isn't as intelligent as people want to think it is. So actually, really, that's surprisingly accurate. Like I've seen some really hilarious. You want a good laugh? Go to PowerPoint, put in a bunch of pictures, and then get generated description and see what it comes up with because it's hilarious sometimes. Um, and other times, it's just like a picture of a phone or like a phone screen or a computer screen. Like it's just there's no there's no anything. You know what I mean? Um, but to, to answer your question, yes, I believe that's what it would read. But do we want it to read that? No. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> okay. so we might take that off. Yeah. Like if we decided yeah. that the painting of group people on boat was sufficient for whatever we were conveying, the yeah. meaning behind it, then we could delete the last part if we decided that we wanted to. Do yes, that. absolutely. Absolutely. If the, if the image is not specifically meaningful to you know the thing, if it's decorative, then yeah, by all means, go ahead and put a painting with a picture of. You know, good starting point. Um, so humans better are better at context, interpretation, abstraction, cultural and contextual sensitivity, um, subjective judgment, error correction. I have to say that is what ChatGPT said when I asked it. <laughs> <laughs> Why are humans better at all texts than AI? So I mean, it does have extremes, but but without being human to yeah. check for errors, mm -hmm. uh, we all speak from this. Yeah, AI is, is definitely helpful yeah. to like get things started, but I don't think at this point anybody should just plug something into AI and take that verbatim right. and use it for whatever purpose they, they have for it. I think there's there's too many too many uh gaps and you know things that can be improved on. Mm -hmm. I says we don't know. Yeah. Okay, any questions about all text? It's very brief. And again, all text is very gray. Like mm -hmm. people want yes and no answers. They want right or wrong. And there's not really a specific right or wrong answer for all text. It all kind of goes down to what is your purpose as the content creator? What is your purpose for having this thing, this image or graph or whatever it is? And then how is the end user going to consume this thing. And that's the, the those two questions I think are what needs to be really answered in order to determine what kind of alt text we're need for this thing. Uh, I have a question. Sure. <laughs> so how do you do this? How do you do all or what's the recommendation to do alt text in real time? So for example, if um, we're in a room with several individuals presenting and they're having these images. So some people can see it, but some people cannot. How do we do that in a real time moment? That's a great question. Um, I think, first of all, one of the uh, basic guidelines for holding a presentation is to share your materials with the audience beforehand, that like preferably. So, and I don't even know if we did this, but anybody can actually we can give you access to these materials that we have. So theoretically, Anna and I are giving a big presentation. We have these images up on the screen. 
beforehand, somebody should have emailed all of the audience to say, here are the materials for the upcoming presentation, if you would like to preview them or, you know, read them. And, and theoretically, those presentations would be accessible, so they would all have alt text already included. So, Terry, and to your point, someone could be following along with us on their own computer, and they would be able to access the alt text kind of as we're going along. Um, the other thing for big presentations like this is for the speakers to basically relay the alt text as we're showing it. So as I did with the, with the images and as Anna explained with the screenshot, whatever images are being shown need to be sort of explained in real time. Anything else to add? Yeah, that, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, I have another question about alt text. Um, Instagram. Mm -hmm. So you said don't put images of text. Mm -hmm. If we're putting something up on Instagram, which is just text. Now, I mean, is it just picture? It's mostly picture, right? right, right. It's very heavily picture based. So yeah. we may put up something for you know advertising a library program, yeah. for example, like a flyer, sort like of. a flyer or something that we create that conveys information visually and inaccessibly mm -hmm. through Instagram that we then post to Instagram and Facebook. So like there's a, you know, text appears somewhere. So I'm not really sure where it appears in Instagram. It appears on Facebook, but. Yeah, with Instagram, I know there's a capability to put alt text in images. So if you go to Instagram and there's like an advanced feature somewhere along there as you're clicking through to post things, you can go to advanced and it has an option for alt text. So you can put in the alt text. Um, Facebook, I don't know if it has that. I'm not sure. I haven't found it yet. Um, and then to specifically answer your question, if you are posting a, a flyer of sorts, um, all of the text should be in the actual post. So you shouldn't be relying on the image like, hey, we're having a thing. Check out this flyer. Like, don't do that. But if you say, hey, we're having this thing. Here's the information. And by the way, here's a picture of the flyer. Like, that's okay because then you've covered your bases by putting the information in the actual post. You see what I mean? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Social media is a little bit of an anomaly because it's not really very easy to make things extremely accessible. Um, but there are kind of workarounds. But the biggest thing to keep in mind with any social media posting is like whatever images you post, you should have some sort of description in the actual text. Thank you. Okay. Any questions online? And we're good to move on to accessible graphs and charts. This is Anna's name. Yes. This so, is now the Anna show. <laughs> so with images, you have to think about what's the context, what's the meaning, how to describe it. But for graphs and charts, you might be the person also designing it. So it's kind of two part create an accessible product, but also having it in that accessible context. So I'm going to go through some examples of it. I want to start us off with a tool, which I often use, which is a color contrast tool. So this is a screenshot of the one I use almost every day. It's a color contrast analyzer. And it's great for just making sure that your foreground and background colors have enough contrast. So that could be for text. It could be for the color of your bar chart. Um, often I'll think I'm like, oh, I got it now. Like I, I can just tell and then I'll check it. Oh, no. actually <laughs> not yet. So it's, it's great to check and it gives you a little check if it passes that contrast for text or for non-text elements. So highly recommend it. Okay, so applying our key concepts in the context of graphs and charts uh, in terms of context, you only want to include data your audience needs to know. So if you're comparing two groups, you don't need all 10 groups. Um, this is something I see a lot with comparing to other city schools. There might be a graph. They're like, here's how we compare to every other school in the state of New York, but not it. You don't need that. It's confusing. Um, and then redundancy. So including other ways of presenting that data information. So maybe long descriptions and a body text if it's in the context of a report, uh, maybe linking to the full data download maybe having a short summary, and then simplicity. So breaking up complicated graphs and tables and being predictable. Uh, 
people usually get bar charts, they get line graphs. If that's what fits, you don't have to uh, make it the most beautiful, complicated graph ever. So the, for this example, we have a fairly simplistic bar chart, bar graph. I don't know what the correct wording is, but whatever. Um, there's kind of a lot of information. There's a lot of numbers there, right? But very generically, we can see from the bars themselves that whatever data points we're comparing is increasing. So the very generic alt text could be the title of the graph, the number of donor funded student scholarship recipients has increased. Just plain and simple. That's all we need to know. Uh, if we want to compare a little bit more, we can say that the number has increased from 277 in 2014 to 466 in 2019. Like I would assume that those are the two biggest data points, the ending, you know, starting and ending. Um, if you wanted to go into detail about each of those individual six data points, I would suggest doing it within the body of the document or whatever content rather than the alt text. Because again, if you start putting too much into alt text, it gets very cumbersome, it gets very confusing. Screen readers can't stop, they can't pause. So a, a screen reader user would have to listen to each individual thing. Um, so it can be very cumbersome. So very important checkpoints about using uh, graphs. Don't rely on color alone. That's like one of the number one suggestions for color, period. Don't rely on color alone for whatever it is you're overlaying. Check the color contrast, as Anna just talked about. Sometimes as sighted users, we see like, a, I love the example of red on white. The default Microsoft red on a white background is not accessible does not meet the standards. As a sighted user, I look at that and go, oh, red on white, easy peasy. That's a contrast. No, it doesn't meet accessibility standards. So always have that in mind and double check contrast. And then with graphs and bar charts and everything else, use titles, direct labels, and borders. And we'll have some examples of these coming up as well um, to kind of help separate and simplify the data points that you are explaining. I actually just saw a graph today in an unnamed journal that had overlapping green and red bars. Oh, oh, oh! Green bar and in and red. I like to show. It was. I heard so shocking. <laughs> <laughs> That's painful. I know. Okay, so I'm going to walk us through a visualization we designed. So I wanted to get some publicly available data that just wasn't connected to anything. So this is looking at Western monarch counts. How many butterflies are there? So I downloaded the data set, uh, stuck it in Excel, and this is automatically generated graph. Um, and I did have a lot more counties, but I just chose two to, to make it simpler for us. Um, so obviously this doesn't look great. <laughs> what are some of the problem areas we can identify? <clears throat> Bottom numbers all yeah. together. Right, right. Bit coders. That, those axes <laughs> numbers. That's, oh, yeah, it's just not working. Yeah. And of course, it's lacking titles and information yeah. because we have it now. I don't blame it at this point for that. So, missing titles. Yeah, axes are not great. What, what, we, yeah, what is the, what, what is going up? What's going down? All right, what, what are we looking at? <laughs> um, so let's see if we add some titles, uh, a title summarizing some declining monarch butterfly populations of Santa Cruz and monarch counties over this time period. We got some axis titles now. Um, I've moved a legend up to the side so that your brain has a little less work to do and you're like, oh, Monterey is orange, Santa Cruz is blue. Um, rotated those years, you can actually read them now. Um, and made the lines a little bit thicker, so they're a little bit easier to see. And you may notice I also removed those horizontal axis lines. You don't have to, that's just a personal preference. Um, it's something referred to as chart junk. If it's like extraneous information that's not supporting um, the data me message, so personal preference on there. Yeah. How do we make it better? So we just talked about colors and redundancy. We don't just want color. Um, we can do a dashed line, for example, 
Um, if we really wanted to draw attention to Santa Cruz more, we could choose orange for that one, maybe a gray for comparison to Monterey. Uh, a few other little details. We could add comma separators in the y axis. So you can actually see those 300,000 and not 300000. Um, and something I like to do in titles is I'll add the colors if I can. For example, if it's just a true comparison like this, I'd say here's Santa Cruz, it's orange, just so you know. Um, and it's also important to check that color contrast. So is the gray okay against the white background? Yes, it's got that check mark. It's four to one. What about the orange? Yes, it is. Also gets that check mark. I think that one was actually a little light at first, so I just nudged it a little darker in that saturation. Here's our before and after. Confusing. It's no titles. And now it's much easier to see the overall message. And of course, knowing that this graph takes place in a larger context. So maybe we also have text description that Santa Cruz County had a drop in populations of 93%. Maybe we want to present the actual numbers in the table. Maybe we could provide a button to download the full data set. So it all depends on the context. We want to make sure we're providing that information in multiple formats. So chart graphs generators, they're quick great. They're very helpful. Uh, if they're not necessarily accessible, you should be checking colors, you should adjust labels, um, and add white space or borders as necessary. Andrew, you said that your first your, your first initial chart was from the generator, right? Like that's what mm -hmm. Microsoft or whatever initially stood out. Yeah. Yes. So that's a great example of how it's not very accessible. Yes. Like um Oh, yeah, it's only as good. You're not always right. So it's like it's only as good as the info you put in yourself, right? right. It's like you got to make sure that you have all the info too to make sure it's correct. But also the ones that are just kind of on the database are sometimes are really wrong too. So it's kind yeah. of like that. Like sometimes not even these generators are correct or AI. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I know. I only made the connection now. I'm like, oh, this is a lot like me saying AI to generate. All text like it can give you a good starting point, yeah. but yeah, but you gotta you gotta fix it. Yeah, I guess I just wonder why sure. Microsoft, for example, yeah. is not more attentive to you would think the yeah. accessibility stuff because yeah. they are supposed to be attentive in a number of ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But why can they not get it into this? Yeah, there are definitely yeah. shortfalls. Um, yes. And and yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I would I would love to kind of have a discussion with the Microsoft development team and be like, yeah. what's up? Why is this still the way it is? Adobe is, and that's a whole different discussion, but Adobe is the, you know, kind of the right. same thing. Yeah. Like you're supposed to be a leader in this right. like genre of information. Why is this still a pain <laughs> to deal with? Yes. So Sometimes I'll, I'll be in an application, I'll try to tab between buttons and it won't let me. I'm like, what? You won't let me keyboard navigate? This is like, yeah. It's supposed to be a given. It is. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Really shocking. When creating things in InDesign, I know like our, our print and publications people, Mary Beth and Melissa, they create things in InDesign. And when they export it to Adobe, instead of having an H1, where mm -hmm. Melissa and Mary Beth put an H1, it decides that everything needs to be like an H4 or something. I don't know. Like that's, mm -hmm. like I said, different rabbit hole, but it's the same principle. Like, yeah, you guys are big wigs in this right. world. You know, why is this a thing? So, a mm -hmm. couple more quick examples. Um, we have just a very plain naked pie chart. Uh, some issues, anyone care to throw out some issues that are happening with this particular thing? What are these things? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I sort of purposefully didn't put any labels on it, but. Um, Maybe because they see the colors or they even are something too light or not. With the the colors are definitely not right. Yeah, I would agree. Because the orange and yellow are not directly next to each other, okay. as long as they're okay on the white background, they can be able to get away with that because they're not right. back to back. The gray is maybe a little light, but yeah, the gray might be light. I don't remember. It's probably fine, but um, 
I mean, first of all, we well, like you said, there's no labels. So, right. you know, T1 is blue, T2 is oh, not okay, that's great, but it's tiny and not bottom. Um, color only, yeah, like we're only using color, and then all of the pieces are kind of squished together. There's yeah. no borders or separation of anything. So, again, that was uh, just straight generator, PowerPoint, or whatever it was. Um, so, if we update it just a little bit, we added the names, and I forget even what this, I think it was just like a generic. Throw me a graph, and that's what they threw me. So I didn't put any labels on it, but I don't know, maybe how many shots were made in a game or something. Um, but the labels and the percentages are in the pie pieces. So now at least our brains can connect the two. If it had a sufficient title label, we'd be able to know what we're reading. Um, the, the text and the color. So again, gray on orange, gray on yellow. I must have checked this, the, the black or gray on the on gray is fairly accessible, but then gray on blue is not. So that pieces in white. And then we added a little bit of separation between each of the pieces. So again, our brains can better comprehend that, you know, this is one entity and this is another entity. And then if we want to push it a little further, uh, pie charts are not a great data visualization form. Uh, we're not great at comparing like our length or area or anything. So if we put that same information on a bar chart, it's a little easier to compare that, oh, team four and team two, team four is a little longer, they have a little more shots made or whatever our example is. Um, so pie charts do have their place, but you know, use them carefully. Um, and as well here, making sure we're using color in the right way. So for example, if we want to emphasize the top team, we can set it aside using that color in that different pattern. Any questions? Well, there's a lot to take in there. Yeah. <laughs> I will say too, as far as like patterns and things, not using color alone, uh, like in, in your initial graph, you had the orange line with the gray dotted line. You don't have to make everything a pattern. You know, the, the, the pie chart doesn't have to be, each four piece doesn't have to have its own pattern. Um, if those two lines, if one was a dotted line and one was like a, a miniature dot, that would be very, that would be even worse to look at, you know. So when you're separating things, you only have to have enough emphasis in order to separate things. Mm -hmm. You don't have to make every piece big and fancy and, you know, right. dotted and colored and everything else. You only have to have enough to emphasize the, the information that you're trying to point out. Right. So we're saying not color alone, but this isn't color alone. It's separated by space itself. Yeah, so that, I mean, given the correct title, like I said, that would be somewhat acceptable, fairly acceptable. Um, but again, to Anna's point, like looking at a pie chart may not always be the best way to, to digest information, so. Okay, I have a question. Um, so Anna, your example at the very beginning about if you're comparing like multiple student schools and you're just comparing two schools, so you don't need to show like all, you know, Let's say if the content is all 13. Right. Um, if you're accessing the graph chart from another source and you've got the 13 in that chart and you really only want to be showing two, is your recommendation to actually recreate the chart with just two, presuming you have, mm -hmm. you know, that you can see what the data numbers are so that mm -hmm. you can recreate it ac accurately? Is that time permitting would that be the best practice because often we are doing exactly that of like comparing with right. other schools right. and we may we may not need all of the schools that are presented in this graph that we get from some other source mm -hmm. so is it better to if there's time to recreate the graph mm -hmm. with just the data we want yeah that's a good question i think if it was me and i had that time um i would just Use the groups we're focusing on, um, but I recreate it. I well, if, it like if it's coming to me as an image, for example, it has like just data points, or do I get like a data set? I'm thinking it, com it comes to you as an image. Mm -hmm. Well, so you would have to like type it in. At that yourself. point, if I'm not the chart creator, then like that was on them. It's I might have to devote my time to other things. Honestly, then. These tips are great for, for you as like the data visualization creator, but if it's like we said before, if this is not happening at the beginning and this is a product you're given, like maybe if you're have extra time you can recreate it, but I, I often 
just can't. It's, right. You can also go back to the source too, because like I in, in the remediation that I've done of online courses, I can find PowerPoints that have like a screenshot of the graphs, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, now I have to put in alt text that describes all of the stuff that's in this graph in the image. Um, which I which from what I understand, images of graphs are not the best like way to go. So as Anna said, um, I had to recreate a lot of these graphs that were in the PowerPoints, which took forever. Um, or you could go back to the source and be like, hey, do you have this in a PowerPoint? Could I get that PowerPoint slide? Or could you share that interactive graph with me instead of taking a screenshot of it? And you know, that way you can at least have a copy of the interactive graph. You could manipulate it a little bit more. You could take out the data points you don't need. You know, I was actually recently just creating a poster for someone that had a lot of data visualizations on it, and some of them I was able to ask them for like the Excel file or whatever, and I could adjust as I needed. But some of it was pictures, and it was like a stacked bar graph. Well, it is what it is. Yeah, sometimes you just have to deal with the information that you were saying before. You have to deal with the information that you were given, mm -hmm. um, and I think in that case, again, putting the all. Not having it as alt text per se, but putting the main point of the graph, you know, like whatever has increased from this day to this day, and then giving all of the specific data points within the, the context of the surrounding text. Okay, so to review our three key concepts are context, redundancy, and simplicity. And this is something I do think about a lot as I'm designing visualization. So why do they actually care about this data? Is it being presented like also in the table? What does that mean data point? Uh, and this is understandable to the average consumer what this data is. So we pulled our information from a number of different places. Um, and again, these are all links. So we can share this with um, the, the three of you or whoever else is interested. Um, there's a couple of different um, the data visualizations from Harvard University. Do you know Harm Guide is the multiple page like PDF booklet, I believe. Um, and then from Snatching Magazine, which is a website and accessibility first approach. There's lots of information out there. Um, of course, you know, the World Wide Web is great, but it also opens a lot of gateways that don't necessarily need to be open. So if you're Googling or searching, just be cautious. Um, search around. We also have um, some information on our accessibility website. We should probably post those on our accessibility website. Um, but we do try to give more information on, on like color and alt text and things like that on the on the website. And uh, I'm personally happy to try to answer any questions that someone has. So you know, email either one of us. Yes. And then the, the TPI, TPGI color contrast analyzer is the screenshot that we showed you before, um, contrasting the foreground and background, and the web aim contrast checker. Also has a similar thing. Uh, those both you can just Google and, and look. Okay. And we do have a handout which summarizes what we talked about today. Um, if you'd like to refer back to it, and Terry and I can also put that link in the chat for you. Yes, please contact us with any question. We're very happy to to learn and to help as needed. Have time left for questions. Is it still a handout? Did you? <laughs> 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 Did you are... This is kind of a it's kind of a really deep rabbit hole uh, to go down, and because it can be so subjective, like I said before, there's not always a black and white answer, and, and sometimes the answer to one question leads to more questions, and that leads to more questions, and then you're down in some other rabbit hole. <laughs> so it's um there's a lot to it, but but there are also a lot of resources and a lot of um, People who kind of know the material a little more than I do, anyway. Um, so there's things out there to, to try to help you figure things out and understand it. And 
the other thing is we don't expect everyone to be experts. You know, just because we attended this doesn't, doesn't mean you have to have perfect alt text the next time you, you know, make PowerPoint presentation. But even just knowing a little bit and incorporating the little bit of information that you can and making your alt text that much better than it used to be is, you know, obviously a step in the right direction and, and helpful. Thank you all very much. Yes. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your time. Thanks, Kieran. Thank, thank you both. It was very informative. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. I, so I feel like in PowerPoint.